Okay, Warren, I see yourself, Bach, Huber, Urban, Hanairo, Wilkinson, and David Shaw is just logging on. So we're still missing Ken, but we do have a quorum. Okay, you might as well get started then. We need a motion for approval of minutes from uh, January. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. second. All in favor for approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, minutes are approved. Uh, okay, next item is a discussion about Bell Farm stormwater. Um, at the commission's request, Bruce Holler is back again to discuss the state of things. Um, back in November of 2021, Water Resources Commission looked at this and made uh, recommendations for 100% infiltration, distributed practices, and uh, soil rehabilitation, I believe. Yeah, deep tail. You know, the developer has submitted several plans that staff has commented on since then. And, you know, I think they're in general accordance now with what we asked them for and and ordinance requirements and everything. Um, it's currently in an, an environmental issue that still needs to get fleshed out and uh bruce holler is back again to discuss i think bruce you can take it away and and maybe just direct me what you want to see on the screen i've got the okay current report attached here okay um, I wonder if I included that. I'm, I've got a um, the report as well, but if there's an excerpt out of the report. I'm not sure that um, you have that I'd like to share if possible. It's related to the environmental portion. Um, and I don't know if you can share your, am I, if I'm allowed to share my screen? Can you make a request maybe to share and then I'll see it pop up? Or maybe I need to stop sharing first. I think that might be. Okay. Um, share screen. Oh. Did anything come up on your end? No. Oh. Post disabled car. So we are. Eric, I think you need oh, to enable him. Yeah. Here we go. I got it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is, I zoomed out a little bit. This is. Um, is an overview of the the layout of the storm basins that uh, we've designed for the uh, for the Bell Farm development as part of the phase one um, as part of the phase one um, portion of the project. Um, what I've outlined here this is an this is part of a uh, the DNR's requirement of a um, uh, materials management plan that takes into account the the soils uh, soils that were tested out here that that had some contaminants detected. Um, they had issued a, a a letter stating that the site was closed and uh, no action was required um, as a result of the findings of the environmental. Um, Report, which which indicated that, that there's a large pile out there that's got some some contaminants in there. It was basically an old quarry that Speedway had, and and they reclaimed it with uh, material from uh, 
Highway 12 construction. And some of the material that's been in there was tested and it, it, it came up with some uh, PHAs and metals and um, some petroleum products in there. Um, but the determination was made by the DNR that the site, the way it sat, if nothing was done with it, it was it was closed and it was um, it was it was not not a a, uh, a contaminated site I guess but if as soon as we um, as soon as we disturbed the site started working with it uh, that a lot that required a uh, this um, materials man management plan which essentially tells shows the DNR where this material that you're excavating and disturbing, where are you gonna go with that? Either offsite, you're gonna haul it off site, or are you gonna put it on site somewhere? If you do put it on site, um, you need to you need to cap it with uh, 12 inches of topsoil. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, a representation of uh, the ponds and the with the green areas being the infiltration areas. Uh, we've got some permeable pavement and bioretention. Um, and then these berms, um, basically we're berming up the area of the ponds to, to contain the water. And then we have a few discharge release, release points to the uh, wetlands and then hopefully the Graver Pond. What you're seeing on this uh, drawing in, in the you know, the brown color is the the fill that we're placing on the, in the berms. I'm going to switch over to another cross section. Uh, this being the cross section of each of the ponds, we've got a fill situation here for the berms where we're going to be placing this material um, so we can lose it on site because it's the, the because it's. It's quite expensive to haul it off to find it, send it, to put it to a landfill or to a place where um, they'll accept it. So we're going to try to get rid of as much on site as we can. And, and one way to do that is to uh, lose it in these berms here. So um, this is uh, this is the brown area that I was showing on the previous slide that shows where that material is going. This material is coming out of that large large stockpile or large pile that's out there now uh, that's getting cut down and relocated um, when we do go into that pile we'll have to there'll have to be some separating and I think uh, our environmental environmental engineer Chris from true north unfortunately he couldn't be here tonight but um, he and I talked yesterday uh, he kind of filled me in and, and you know, we'll have to um, go through that, um, that pile and, you know, make sure that we've, we get the, we not only get the, um, the material that's been determined to be contaminated out of there and placed in this uh, management plan area. Um, but he also has to verify that that we've gone down far and everything's as much of it, or we we've, we've taken care of of the material um, that we've encountered. Bruce. Um, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, this is Jim. Do you mind if we ask questions while you're discussing? Oh, sure. This? Yeah. Um, that pile we're talking about. Uh, the so that was a waste pile from highway 12 or just the cap material was from highway 12 construction it's my understanding that it's it's it there was a quarry speedway had a quarry in this area oh. and it, when they reclaimed it throughout the years they they allowed material to come in and part of that pile was from the uh, highway 12 construction some of the contractors disposed some of their of Broken concrete, maybe some asphalt, some gravel, um, okay. some of the excess that they had, they had um, used, they had gotten from the old highway. And, they and that's in. the mound that we see out there. That's uh, 
it's just kind of in a wooded condition right now. Is that right? Right. It it looks it's pretty obvious. It's that large mound that it's man made. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, so and, the the waste the management plan would allow you to even if some of the material is contaminated to keep it on site and recap it in the berms of the of the of the stormwater ponds. Is that what uh, is being proposed? Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. We're we're taking that material and there because it's at a, at a, a level of contamination that's that's pretty low. Um, this this sort of remediation is is what the DNR will allow. Okay. And that material that materials management plan. I think I think Chris just finished that up, or he's finishing it up within the next day or so and submitting it to the DNR for their final uh, final once over and, uh, and approval. Um, he did he did want me or I do want to in um, you know just make sure that that um, that you under that I let you know that the contaminants that were found out there within this pile, the PHAs and metals, um, they're not mobile in water, so they don't dissolve in water. So he, he had no concern at all regarding um, relocating these near, relocating this material near an area that we're going to be infiltrating. Um, he had indicated that, well, it, it's infiltrating now. I mean, or, I mean it's, it, it, it's there now. We're just moving it to a different part of the site. But in this case, we're capping it um so that so that the the risk of water getting through and leaking through uh, is minimized Bruce this is Warren can you go back to that cross section and explain sure. how the ponds work how what well you got two different basins there so you have a, oh. a smaller basin uh, trapped uh, bioretention than a, an overflow or a pipe yeah, going into what, a, what we have here is is this these discharge where the where the storm sewer pipes discharge from the streets, um, we've got a four bay <clears throat> where it fills up. Um, looks like um, nine oh nine to nine ten. It, it's a one foot deep four bay uh, with a with a, a connect pipe connector that ultimately then drains into the bioretention portion of the of the ponds. I'll go back to this one here. Oops. Um, so this area here in white is a is a storm sewer discharge, and that's a four bay. And then on each side of that, once this fills up, it spills into these bioretention areas on either side. Um, and that's one pond we call the west pond. This east pond. Kind of that same scenario. We were in, the, in white here. We have the four bays where the storm sewer discharges from the street. Once that fills up, it it uh, spills into the green areas for further uh, sediment removal and infiltration. Um, so, what's the purpose of the small pond? Go back to that cross section again. The small pond here is the four bay, just to settle out any of the larger particles as they come off the street. It's not for infiltration. No, although okay. I think there is some. Um, there might be some infiltration that some credit we've gotten for that um, because of just you know because they're in the modeling it takes in, it takes into account for that. But um, the primary infiltration is through the uh, sandstone storage layer and then the bioretention area. So the bioretention and infiltration are the same? Yes. Yeah. Because the bioretention, you know, with that with that engineered media, um, that'll the water will filter through that to get to the storage layer for the sand and then and then into our native into the native soils. Um, the test bits we dug we didn't run into any uh, any groundwater um, in this at these depths, so um, so I think we're gonna I think we're gonna have some pretty good um, 
um, capabilities for infiltration here. And, and Bruce, we don't, so these figures you're showing us right now are not in our packet, is that right? This, well, the, the cross sections are, they should be. The, I just kind of take, I've just taken this, these cross sections and for the, for the, for the materials management plan, I kind of dressed them up with, with these um, notes regarding for the DNR, so they could see what we were doing with the, with the uh, material from the pile. Okay, I see, and they are here. I do have them down. Yeah. And none of these basins, stormwater features, uh, are within any of the wetland bound map wetland areas. Correct. Right. So, um, we've. So we've got a wetland, a WL line, which is the wetland limits uh, that we delineated. And then CARPC has a requirement of uh, a 30 foot buffer before we can do any disturbance. So that's why we've, we've got this offset, the berm offset uh, in general, about 30 feet from this wetland, from that boundary. So, So Bruce, what frequency storms are those detention basins be able to handle? Are those your flood control uh, basins then too? They are, yes. They are uh, sized through the 200 year event. Um, we've we've um, not only, uh, these are the phase one ponds. You can kind of see the start of uh, another pond up here. These are, that's a, um, uh, the end of another basin that collects um, collects runoff and has been has been sized to handle a different watershed within the development. I'm gonna see if I so yeah this is a, this is, yeah if I could interject and I could go back to sharing my screen perhaps but the commission may be in need of a uh, an overview of the whole plan. Uh, oh, sure. More than just the phase one. That sheet that Bruce had showed you guys for the materials management plan is really only the basins that are being constructed with the first phase. So there are others. And um, I'll share, I think. And while you're doing that, Eric, just to be clear, none of this at this point in time has gone over to the county for their review with this because we're still in the no the the county has reviewed and commented and uh bruce has been working through their comments and mine and uh Kirpsey's comments i guess is that correct bruce okay gotten comments from Kirpsey? um i haven't submitted the Kirpsey yet i wanted to kind of get uh um, sort of a, a final uh, product out there before uh, that was acceptable to the other agencies. But I think this this um, keeping in mind as as we develop this that CARPC will have to obviously uh, look at that and review it as well. Okay. But yeah, so this is this is the development um, as a whole. Um, on the west side, lots one, two, three, and four on the bottom, they are, they've been set aside to do their own, in, own stormwater management as the lots develop. So we've, uh, we've um, omitted that from, from the other, from the ponds, other than introducing the, the outflow from those into this, into the system for essentially a bypass into the pond and then out. But that that water will be treated um, uh, on site. And your intent is to get a hundred percent infiltration from those lots, essentially on those lots. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, that was one of the requirements in the, in the minutes from well, a little over a year ago. These large lots are the more intensely developed um, multifamily kinds of things. So the plan there is for underground storage uh, with infiltration. Correct. Yep. And he, 
the and we 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 set a um, a goal of each of those lots having a uh, twenty five percent green space requirement. So so they're limited to seventy five percent impervious on each lot. Whoops, uh, we kind of um, set that as our as our as our goals. Um, and so these basins down here are the ones you were just looking at on that other sheet. And I, I guess I'd call these the main basins in conjunction with a, a linear basin over on this side. Mm -hmm. Not to be built in phase one, though, because none of this development is happening yet. Um, Correct. But this will go in as phase one. You know, and phase one includes this area and some of the multifamily stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the Bruce, other features, uh, Bruce, are per a lot of pervious pavement. Anything that you see this kind of densely hatched thing, and I pulled this up from an older plan, Bruce. Um, mm -hmm. Let me know if you see anything that's changed since then. No, it looks about right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And though, so those are on driving lanes themselves, Bruce and Eric? Yeah, those are private streets, um, residential. So they're, um, you know, they're, you can see there's, there's a number, uh, it's more of a local um, traffic pattern that you'll see on those. Um, so those are not city right of ways, is that what we're saying? Right. They're, they're owned and maintained by the association. Okay, including the one that's uh, to the east of where your hand is right now. Yep. Yeah, that loops up all the way into uh, Bellefontaine, and that'll be all uh, private as well. And I think part of the reasoning for that is that the city does not want to take over a bunch of pervious pavement. Yeah. Uh, but we will have public utilities running beneath those streets, you know, through an easement. Mm -hmm. Bruce, uh, this is Warren. Um, later on, we're going to talk about um, salt problems. And so what do you feel the effect of pervious pavement and um, that salt would have with uh, infiltration of pervious pavement and your infiltration basins? Um, Salt will bind up with any clay particles and uh, clog up the infiltration capability. So, yeah. Uh, um, so, what do you think about that? Well, I know we've got, and, and one of the, one of the comments that came up from Elliot at the county was um, was the uh, once minimum of a once per year vacuum vacuuming of those streets. Um, now we, I. Honestly, I haven't gotten um, done too much research into the salt portion of it, but um, um, you know, but we're, you know, we, I understand that that you know, not only is there going to be salt, but there'll be sand and, and dirt particles and that. So, um, you know, we're going to want to certainly make sure that we we address that um, well more than likely infiltration basin is going to become uh it's going to infiltrate right on through and go into the groundwater system i would guess um there's some evidence that the permeable pavement areas may require less winter sand or salt because they, they tend to melt quicker um there's been some studies like that in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So I hope that there might be less need for any kind of uh, treatment um, on the average anyway. Yeah, and, and and I think as you as you mentioned there, um, I think the, the the asphalt itself, I believe, is a little bit more coarse. Um, so I think, you know, a combination of that with with the uh, being a little being it being a little 
warmer. <clears throat> Eric? Eric, are you going to make any, or, can, or are you, can you make any kind of recommendations that they would, on the paver, on the permeable pavement, go with pavers as opposed to uh, asphalt or concrete? What's the reasoning? Well, the, I think the asphalt is still problematic as far as uh, standing up. I, I, I I'll have to do some more looking into it, but there, there are some issues with that. Well, if I, I hadn't thought about that, Jim. Streets. I do know that uh, the pervious asphalt that the city had bought before, was, I think, was from the plant on Highway 14, DRS, I want to say, just west of uh, the city. And I think that was just bought up by Payne and Dolan. Um, you know, which is a much larger firm. And just thinking about it, I was hopeful that uh, there may soon be a higher quality of pervious asphalt that could be an option. Was, was their performance not good in the city's experience? Correct. Okay. Um, I also had a question. I just wanted to clarify. So the most of the streets will be maintained by the association, but what about Bellefontaine Boulevard, since that continues into another neighborhood? Uh, the public streets are Bellefontaine and Serenby, which will also have an entrance off of Parmenter and then run north-south. Okay. These interior streets are the private ones. Mm -hmm. This alley. So Bruce, this is Warren again. What so with your plan? This plan here, you'll get 100% infiltration. So our modeling shows um, with the basins that we have in here, we've got a couple uh, <clears throat> area basins further up. Um, there's an outlot of P11. There's an area up there. Uh, yeah, right there's another one where we're doing some uh, bioretention. We vault mod when we model all that we get we get a, a reduction of uh, we hit ninety eight and a half percent. So what we then um, are requiring each lot owner in the covenants and deed restrictions, we're requiring each lot owner, single family and 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 others, um, to provide some to provide a <coughs> permeable driveway in case of a, in case of a single family home a uh, permeable driveway and some sort of rain either rain garden a cistern uh, rain barrel some sort of or maybe even some soil conditioning deep tilling um, that's going to be required for each of these uh, homeowners as well so by doing that as uh, through a plat wide level and as a more of a source driven um practice uh, we feel that that extra that's what gets us to a hundred percent now we don't have really any way to model that just because it's all spread out and um you know but but i you know i think from a um practical standpoint that's that gets us to to the intent of infiltrating a hundred percent what happens during frozen ground now bruce with all these things Well, I guess the same thing that's happening now when when yeah. with practices, it's just it, you got to wait till it thaws, I guess, and um, then they can once they thaw, then they can start working again. So we really aren't infiltrating. We probably won't infiltrate one hundred percent of the the precip during the, at least the winter months. There'll be runoff. We likely, yeah. Every, yeah. every time we say this one hundred percent number. Tell me if I'm right or wrong here. Uh, I believe what we're talking about is using, you know, the wind slam rainfall file, which does not include winter. It's 100% the wind slam rainfall file. That's what's being uh, infiltrated. Am I, am I correct in that? That's yeah, correct. I believe it's the 1981 yep. average annual 
Uh-huh. Right, which starts in, you know, I don't know if it's March or April and ends in November or December. So it's, you know, it's 100% of that rainfall that we're talking about. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's March 13th, maybe, to December yeah. 3rd. Okay. <clears throat> so, Eric, I have a, I read in the draft plan about the long-term maintenance requirements for these individual practices on property and you know, they talk about the homeowner association or, or uh, HOA being responsible for some reporting and landowners for other reporting. And you're, you are in agreement with that approach for ensuring these things are still functional? I have not um, reviewed the most current maintenance agreement. Um, the first or maybe the second iteration of this that came through, uh, the, the developer's team was trying to provide lot by lot infiltrative features. And honestly, I put the kibosh on that and said, you know, there's no way we could be able to track all of that, I, I et cetera. Yeah. So they kind of backed off a little bit and tried more, you know, I would say still distributed, but grouped uh, larger facilities. Number one, more efficient, you know, and number two, easier to manage and maintain. Um, Bruce came back with, I think it was at the time, 99% infiltration and I thought that philosophically that would be okay in conjunction with these uh, lot by lot requirements, you know, which would be uh, enforced through the subdivision covenants, which, you know, at that point, the city would be would step out of that. We wouldn't be trying to enforce anything with that, but I think the net result would probably get us what we wanted. You know, the, the trade-off is how do we ensure they're built and maintained? We can't. <clears throat> yeah, I, I share that concern. So, yeah. I, you know, I'm it's, so what you're saying, there's a lot of faith and trust built into this. Well, yeah. 1%. Yeah. It's just that top edge. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> well. Did you catch that Ken Potter is online? He's been on. Yeah, I am. I've been. Ken yeah, it was just a few time. minutes late. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, on the individual homes, I guess the key is, you know, what they do with their downspots. Uh, and, you know, that's, uh, if you, you could do that, you could, if you run the downspot in the driveway, you know, that's not going to work, right? So somehow we have to have uh, some kind of wording that says that, uh, um, I don't know how we do this with the, what have we done in the past with the individual houses, individual homes? Uh, this, I don't think had ever been uh, proposed yeah. before, Ken. Yeah, so I guess we just got to make sure that the agreement with, uh, when we set this up, that there's a uh, a strong effort to, uh, to, to again, locate the downspots in, in ways that minimize, you know, that maximize how much is spread <clears throat> how much goes over some lawn before it gets to the to the uh, street. Um, I mean that usually usually works out, but it doesn't have to. So I don't know. That's something we have to think about. That's uh... Uh, this is Kathleen, and I just wanted to um, state that our attorneys we've been going back and forth with <clears throat> myself and Bruce as we're finishing up our first, well, our first draft of the covenants that we want to present, you know, to the city to review. 
And so <clears throat> there's just been a little back and forth as we've been tightening up the language regarding the stormwater management and the requirements by the homeowners in terms of the pervious um, pavement on the driveways and, and the additional measures that'll be required. And so Ken, I'll <clears throat> also take what some of the language you just said specifically regarding the downspouts, we'll work that into the covenant, uh, the covenants, and then we'll present uh, that section back for you guys to just review so that you can see that as part of the covenants, this is a requirement for each one of the homeowners. They can't build unless they're going to use, um, you know, the pervious pavement and that they're going to agree to these additional um, stormwater measures. And that could be individual per home. It might be look a little different per home in terms of how, how they'll manage that, whether they're using a rain garden or barrels or a cistern or something along those lines, but it has to be part of the process. So um, again, we we were almost finalized with that language, but now I'll, I'll just make sure to add something additional about the downspouts, and then we'll make sure that you guys are good with that language. Because this has been an intention all along that uh -huh. even though I totally understand from a logistics standpoint, the city doesn't want to be um, having all these different property owners submitting, you know, stuff regularly for you guys to have to track and review. I totally get that. But it's been a part of who we wanted to be from all along that that there is, um, in addition to the fact that obviously we need the extra 1%, but in addition to that, we want everybody, you know, um, having awareness about this, being mindful about it, taking action on it on their own property. It's a part of who we are overall as a development. So I, I'm hoping that the language and the covenants will, um, you know, provide you guys with the level of comfort that you need. And we can always talk about additional measures, if not. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, you know, the, the truth is you can, you can use lawns to, uh, capture a lot of water and it's in the it's in the landowner's uh benefit to uh to make sure downspots are spread as much as possible over green space because then they don't have to worry about uh watering their lawns and so on so uh if i think if you push that idea that um uh, uh, that they that down there's a lot of thought goes into how the downspouts are routed or how the flow from the downspouts are routed so you, you know you don't want it obviously to go right into a into the uh, impervious area. It's great that you've got the driveways, by the way. So that's a, that's a great start. So anyway, uh, I I, th I think that can work out. Great. I think it's a it's a what I love about it is it's a one of those things that's a simple and yeah. elegant solution. Right. 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 Could be a model. I had a question about the um, phase 1A construction schedule. So when when will all, it says streets as part of 1A, will all the streets be put in during 1A or if not, which ones? So 1A, the streets that are gonna be put in as installed as part of 1A is um, Bellefontaine from Parmenter to through the intersection, oh, here we go. Yeah, so it'll be the, that stretch of Bellefontaine and then Therenby South to a uh, temporary turnaround. Uh, that's phase 1A. And in the apartments, of the, yeah, the, the purple colors are the uh, buildings that are proposed right now. Um, and these detention facilities. And those, yeah, and those detention mm -hmm. basins. Yeah. Bruce, the shotguns will will also be uh, able to be in 1A because they'll be serviced by the parlor row and stuff too. Yeah, so the, the lots that are west, on the west side of Serenby, those, that bank of lots will be available as well as part of phase 1A. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Bruce, what do you do if you find out the permanent uh, the permanent pavers are not functioning because uh, probably salt is uh, reacting and clogging them up? Mm -hmm. So how would you fix that? Vacuuming won't do it once it dissolves. Salt dissolves. It, it dissolves and um, and then clogs things. Yeah. 
How would you yeah, fix that? Yeah, that's a good question for I. You know, that's again, I, I don't have the answer to that right now. I don't. You just you know, I have to probably look at do some reading, some literature, and see what's been done to in those instances. Um, the permanent payment, Warren, would be, you know, a part of the maintenance agreement that that the developer enters into with the city. Okay. But that, if, that's true. So if it's not working, how do you know? Water would be ponding in the street eventually. It would what? Would be ponding on the surface of the street eventually. Well, if there's no grade, it would flow down the street, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but the way these are or should be set up would be that the 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 uh, storage layer for the permeable pavement would be located in a in a sag. Mm -hmm. it, is there a proposal for any curb and gutter on those private streets? Yeah. So the private streets are are designed in such a manner where. Um, where it's a full cross slope so that it maximizes the contact time that the water has with the permeable pavers or with the permeable pavement rather than a crown because water is going to come from these lots and driveways into the street um, but it will be lined with curb and gutter so the bottom side of the street once it comes across the pavement um, in the larger events it'll or whatever it doesn't pick up It'll, it'll hit the curb and then run down to the inlets at the low points. You don't have a cross section of the streets at this point. Uh, there should. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to have to scroll. These, there were comments from uh, Elliot Mergen and myself on the set up for the permeable pavements and that I think that's something Bruce is still working through. Um, I know we I know we've updated the cross or the cross sections uh, back to that yeah there um, this is that's just the pavement cross section but I know we have a detail sheet that has that shows the um, the you know curb sheet number it is Bruce this might just be a partial set. Yeah. But I think the comments were to super elevate the pavement, essentially keeping the water on the permeable pavement off of the gutter. Mm -hmm. we, we should should be making sure that we're not they're not going to salt the permeable pavements. Because uh, that can clog them up. Uh, uh, they're going to solve them. Have a need. If they're working, you shouldn't need to have, uh, uh, you know, any salt. Uh, if they're working, they shouldn't need it. Yeah, right. And if if we start seeing them using salt, that's going to be a good indicator that uh, they're not working. Well, I would be. I would bet they're going to use salt on those streets, aren't they? No, I'm thinking about the the driveways and the. Oh. And the sidewalks and stuff like that. The streets different. Yeah. The same streets are going to salt, I'm sure. Yeah, not put, no, that's not really put sand on it. We want to discourage salt on the on the driveways and uh, uh, sidewalks because that that'll just make things worse. For you know, it could kill the permeability. And we can. That's something we can also uh, include as part of our our duty restrictions and covenants. Or in the, and make sure the HOA is aware to, you know, to minimize their use of salt. Right. That is definitely language that can be placed in the covenant in that area regarding the um, permeable pavement for the driveways. I, I'm sorry for being ignorant here, but if you're going to reduce salt usage, aren't you going to increase use of sand or some other things to provide friction? And isn't that going to clog the, the pavement, the porous part? 
I don't it's understand. It's easier to remove the why sand, would, though, Dave. Why would you need and that? Yeah. By by vacuuming, um, if it well, gets maintained properly, anyway. I'll I'll grant you that, but on my walk to work from the parking lot to the building, uh, we have uh, pavers uh, that uh, since they pop up and heave, then it's hard to uh, to scrape them efficiently. So the solution is to pour huge amounts of salt down. <laughs> And um, if you want a, one of the models for um, overuse of salt, I, I can give you some. Um, and uh, the city mandated all this uh, forest pavement with these pavers, and um, it's not doing anything good for the lakes. Mm -hmm. My two cents. Yeah, I agree with that, David. I want to hear what uh, you know. Madison's haven't been doing a pilot study for about two and a half years now with with USGS on this on pavers in parking lanes, um, and I'd like to hear what uh, what their experience has been, both from a maintenance point of view and from salt, sand, and infiltration point of view. I I, I can look into that. City of Madison, we're talking about here. Is that the one Phil Gable is working on? You guys know yeah. him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so Bruce, where do you, where are we in this process? What, what is your, <laughs> I know this is <laughs> three years behind schedule, but anyway. Well, um, well, I think we're at the point, we're at the point now where we've, we've gone through a few iterations for, for a final approval. And I think we've addressed um, the, you know, the comments um, and, you know, ideally we, we, we'd we like to be able to get this to the point where a permit could be issued to, to begin the uh, construction of the ponds and, and start grading in April. And I think right now we, you know, with the, um, I think, I think we're, we're, we're very close to that. I think it's just a matter of um, you know working some of that language into the deed restrictions, um, stressing the to minimize the use of the sand and salt, and addressing you know incorporating some of the comments we heard tonight as well. Um, but the goal is to to um, to start building these ponds, um, you know, in a month in in April. Um, and in order to do that, we would, uh, the last, um, the permit we need would be through the city. I, I saw somewhere reference a, uh, question in, in response or, a, a staff city staff comments and then a response to each comment. And I'm sorry, I haven't gone through all 520 pages of this packet tonight, but I haven't seen, is that in here somewhere? Jim, you may be talking about the next agenda item. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> Funny how I get mixed up like that. Okay. Bruce, do you have the calculations for the deten detaining uh, floods? Yeah, those are incorporated in this, into this uh, uh, management plan. And the, the, the two main basins are Ours right there is are the um, are the peak control and rate control is happening in those two main ponds there, and there's a step summary chart right there is where what we've uh, modeled. So this this is a combination. That table two is a combination of all the of one each one pond or. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the the combination of of the entire system the way we have it designed which includes both basins um, and the storage in those so i think we're, we're real we're real the, between the one one and two year events the, the reason i believe that they're so low is because of that area that we need for the infiltration and the TSS control. So that really 
drives the release rate down. Well, it looks like it does a good job controlling flood peaks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, in fact, I think, uh, it's, like I said, I think it's the, uh, the infiltration and TSS is what kind of controls the sizing. And then we just, because of that, you, the, the peak kind of takes care of itself. One of the earlier discussions we had, Bruce, we worried about the, what the impact would be on Graber Pond as far as the flows into it, flood peaks and total volume. And you said you might look at, the, or we're going to look at that, have you? And what did you decide? Well, the, you mean from a volume standpoint, the total right. volume? Right. What's the impact going to be to Graber Pond? Well, the rates you can see are, are, are going to be um, substantially lower. Um, I haven't had, a, I mean, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to our, to Ryan Moe, our, our, our the guy or design engineer who did this to ask him about the uh the volume if you take a look at the volume for the i'm assuming for the larger events is what you're referring to well i think the total runoff so if you get to 100 percent infiltration if that really occurs the pond elevation shouldn't increase over normally but if we don't get 100 percent infiltration and we don't take care of uh during the winter period we'll have more runoff and um it's very likely the pond elevation of Graper Pond could increase and we get more discharge downstream. And we then have to worry about the outflow of Graper Pond and its effect on the channel downstream. Well, I think in the in the instances of um, if, with the in the winter time, if it's the rate, you know, I think we've got we're showing a pretty good uh, attenuation of those peak of those peaks and bringing those down quite a bit, um, you know, so that can, if there's a concern with the water, you know, of, of us holding it, enough water back and, and releasing it at a, at a slower rate, um, I think that's, I think these ponds that are, are, um, are sized to, to handle that and to help, help with that. Did you look at that Mars uh, study that we did back in, uh, it must be 2010? 2010 or six. Uh, they did a model study of the basin using premise model and with different scenarios, one being full development of uh, this watershed. And of course, diverting some of the water from Tribeca and uh, what's that, uh, Hill, Hill Slope and one across the belt line. And one of the scenarios was uh, elevation at 904, mm -hmm. but actually with this development of 100% infiltration, um, we might have a little bit less than uh, pre-development conditions, but with different seepage rates, it could go up to 60% um, more discharge. So with different seepage rates, it got widely different results. Now the model calibrated better with the see a trade of uh, 0 0.024 inch uh, feet per day than the other one. But mm -hmm. there is a concern there that uh, we're gonna get more water into Graber's Pond than we had before. Yeah, and I don't, um, I can, you know, Ryan recently, recently joined our firm from Mars. So I can, um, you know, I can, I don't, I don't know. If, I don't know that he was involved with that study, but I, I, um, I can certainly reach out to Mars or EOR right now, as they are now, and um, and see if the if when we incorporate this, our modeling as part of that. Is that what you're thinking? Then see what rerun that model to see what the impact is. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, mean, Eric, I think I'm wrong again, <laughs> but, you know, just to be clear, the larger storms into Graber Pond and out will certainly have a longer time period of discharge, even though the rates are reduced, it'll be a longer time period and more volume over time will still be discharged from the site to the offsite downstream areas. Uh, when you look at all the range of, of, of rainfall events and 
continuous, you know, back to back storms and things like that. Um, we're, you know, I don't want to, I don't think I want to um, delude anybody that we're having, you know, less total water leave the site post development in the long run. Mm -hmm. Is there something faulty with that conclusion? No, that's true. And, you know, for the less technical members of the commission, when we say 100% infiltration, it's based on a, an annual rainfall record, an actual one from 1981. I want to say the largest rainfall event in that year is like two and a half inches. Yep, right in that range. Yep. So any storm bigger than that, yeah, would result in more runoff towards Graber Pond, not in peak flow rate, but in total volume discharged. Right. Um, you know, what we asked for was 100% infiltration, which just like every other development, this is modeled, you know, and, and reliant upon future maintenance and all of those things. You know, what we're trying to say is that in the average year, the volume of runoff is the same as, as in the pre-developed condition, which is also not the existing condition. The city's ordinance artificially um, pulls that back farther and it, it's tried, we try to compare it to the pre-settlement condition where this was all meadow and woodland and not agricultural land. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, that's what we asked them to do. Um, and that's what they're working towards is that 100% infiltration. Let me just be clear, just to make sure that, um, you know, this is, I agree, this is a very robust stormwater management comprehensive system here so i'm not i'm not uh uh discarding that or, or criticizing that at all it's it's a very comprehensive system i think you're doing a great job but i don't also don't want people to think that it's going to be like you said uh controlling all runoff all times in the in the long term it's still there will still be you know, more water going down to down the system. And that's that's just the nature of developing land. You can't, there's some laws of physics here we can't uh, uh, violate, I guess. Um, so anyway, that's just my my speech for the, for the evening. Another thing I should mention too, while that Mars model uses PRIMS, which is, uh, I think is the right model to use. Uh, they incorporate, it does incorporate evapotranspiration, but they only use it from the, uh, the pond itself, not the whole watershed. And evapotranspiration accounts for two thirds of the of the loss from precip. So like precip is 35 inches a year. Uh, runoff is about 12 inches and other 23 inches of evapotranspiration. With this much impervious area, we're gonna lose that water that goes to evapotranspiration and it's now going to become runoff. And that's a big number. Now, hopefully that'll go through the infiltration basins, but I don't know. So I think we should anticipate we may have higher volumes of runoff in the Graber Pond, and how is the city going to deal with that? Or in that Graber outlet project, which is kind of awaiting these final numbers, is <clears throat> the intent is to be able to handle flood flows uh, out of Graber Pond and safe right. and pass them through Misty Valley and on downstream. So more than likely the pond will stay close to 904. And so any kind of inflows, runoff events that we have will be passed on through the pond. If that's... The worst case scenario. Yeah, yes, that's the right way to phrase that. Hopefully not, but regardless, what, what they will model is a, a Graber full condition. Here comes a hundred year flow 
let's pass it through safely. Yeah, I think it'll handle the 100 year flow okay, but is what's the impact of having a lot more discharges uh, frequently during the year? Was it, can the channel handle that downstream? Or we have to have a new channel design? Well, which channel? Uh, the outflow from Graber Pond through Graber. Misty Valley. Yeah, it would be designed to handle that. Bruce, when you talk about uh, the person who did the model, you might ask them uh, why they didn't, or could they incorporate evapotranspiration into the model? I know when USGS did it on the North Fork, they used uh, evapotranspiration for the whole watershed. And if you look at their report, they show a loss of uh, 23 inches a year to evapotranspiration. Yeah, I don't know. Um... I'm not. Yeah, I'll I'll ask Ryan to see what he knows about that. With, with the the, I would assume the wind slam modeling is where, if it does show up anywhere, it would be there. Um. So yeah, I can I can certainly um, ask him what if there's a way to kind of pull that out to see if to isolate that and see what see what sort of impact that has. Okay. Do we have anything else to talk about on this, um, Eric? Not on my end, no. I wasn't looking for a recommendation. Um, you could make- So this is more of an informational meeting, informational meeting for both of us. Update. An update, yeah. yes. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. The next one is the Red Tail Ridge, Red Tail Ridge Stormwater Plan, formerly known as as Acre uh, Property Development. Uh, I like the I like the name. <laughs> Off to a good start. Water Resources looked at this uh, last spring and made similar recommendations to uh, what you did for Bell Farm. Distributed practices, 100% infiltration. And at that time we asked them to, you know, do a uh, preliminary soils investigation so they could try to cite these infiltrative practices well. Um, one thing that came up recently is a developer's proposal to, to try and use offsite pass through water uh, to meet their infiltration requirements. Um, I don't, I think Tony Vandermoose with uh, Smith Group is here to, to give a presentation on this. And I think um, Tony should proceed and then. After that, we can talk about this uh, this one specific question. Also, you know, it's it's atypical to allow this pass through water to to be creditable, if that's the right word. Um, but uh, Tony, are you uh, on here? Tony is muted. Double mute. There Happened is. again. Uh, Eric, I did add one slide to the end of this. So um, if I can share my screen. Yeah, you may. You have it as an option. Are we seeing what I'm seeing? No. Huh. You should have the ability. Oh, I, I forget with Zoom, you have to actually hit the share button. <laughs> Thank you. 
Are you guys seeing your faces now? Not anymore. Okay. Go away. We see a project location with a two mile radius. Lovely. Hey, that's great. Okay. So, yep, uh, this is just a reminder of, of where the site is. Um, do you see my cursor? Probably not. Okay. I can't seem to figure out how to get rid of. There we go. Okay. Can you see my cursor now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so Gray River Pond is right here. So we're not too far away from where we were just talking. Um, so we did just recently meet with CARPC last week uh, for Urban Service Area Amendment um, and just showing, again, the regional context and our location uh, immediately adjacent to Pheasant Branch uh, Conservatory. Um, these are the exhibits that we shared with you um, back in March, showing that the uh, the site is almost entirely agricultural fields. There's a high point on the north side that sends water everywhere. Um, there are some steep slopes, and there is an existing wetland um, that was delineated on the south side. Um, so um, Eric already summarized this, but um, the uh, the recommendations that you guys had made. Um, back in March was the 100% stay on, as well as distributed um, systems and the uh, requirement to do preliminary soil investigations before we got too far down the road with design. And so this is now the um, updated master plan that's been created um, for the site. This is, this is new. Um, you guys haven't seen this before. Um, but so the, it's anticipated that there'll be um, 867 dwelling units um, and a, a density of about seven units per acre. Um, the existing wetland shown down here in the south with the associated buffers um, that are required, as well as an interconnected network of green space that goes throughout um, the neighborhood. Higher density units on the west side that are along high road with a lower density along Pheasant Branch. Present branch is intended to remain a rural road where high road is intended to be a collector road. And then the same Bellefontaine continuation going up and through the site and future uh, connection to the north side. Um, so as I had men mentioned, um, a lot of open space, uh, a lot of interconnectedness um, to the site. Um, and we're looking at about 28% open site, open space for the entire site. And that doesn't even include any open space that would be provided within the denser um, multifamily spaces. Hey, hey, Tony? Yeah. Quick question from Jim. What What is the proposed municipal boundary out here? Is there one yet at this point in time? Or uh, what would the city of Middleton's boundary be uh, in this area? The city of Middleton boundary would... Um, basically it's easily seen in here so there's um the Ackers family purchased these lots built their homes they purchased one more prior to the sale so there's one additional rural house that will come in um, but the city of Middleton and the Kerbsey boundary are both proposed to be um the sawtooth essentially a cookie cutter out around the parcels yep and Okay, okay, and be half of the road, and I take it, Pheasant Branch itself? Yep. Okay. And so um, we conducted 46 total test pits throughout the site, um, a lot of, mainly because we didn't really know what we were going to be doing. We knew a general idea of where some of the major roadways would be. Um, we knew where some of the low spots would be, but we're going to be, but we knew that we wanted to do some distributed work. Um, so we did a lot of test pits. Um, a and B soils were encountered throughout. Um, there's even a uh, old two acre gravel quarry out there that um, gets ridiculous infiltration. Um, but we've found the full gamut of soil types um, out there as far as infiltration capacities. Um, there was um, higher groundwater encountered um, at uh, test pit three 
there wasn't at one, two, or four. There was also higher at 35, 36, and 38 uh, around the wetland, which was kind of to be expected. And then there was also some redox effects encountered at 37 and 38. <clears throat> um, up on the higher portion of the site, as expected, there was um, highly weathered bedrock that was encountered within five feet. Um, luckily, um, 13 and 20. So right here and uh, where's 13? Right here are the uh, two locations that are higher, um, the uh, easily avoidable um, as far as the uh, development is concerned. So the main stormwater approach is to do essentially cascading bioretention facilities throughout the site, allowing uh, one unit to be conveyed overland or piped onto to the next system. And so we have a series of bioretention throughout the site, as well as um, incorporation of the multifamily lots. And um, then on the north corner, the southwest corner and the southeast corner, we provided um, regional facilities, which would be uh, a typical wet pond that goes into an infiltration basin. Um, we were very conservative with the design. This was a master plan design, so it was really a preliminary design. Um, but we assumed that all the multifamily houses, all the lightest yellow on the screen, all of that, those are high density residential with alleys, um, land, to, land type as Winslam proposes. And then we have um, cottage homes, townhomes, and multifamily homes. And I assumed all of those were um, high rise residential, which essentially is very, very little uh, green space associated with, with that type of development. And the reason we did that is because, again, as we get into the design phase, we don't want to find ourselves coming up short. And so the goals, um, again, were to provide the one to the 200 year peak. 100 year average annual stay on and 80% TSS removal and um, bioretention basins, infiltration basins, bioswale, soil conditioning, native planting are all in the works to provide a, uh, a cohesive um, design throughout the site. Tony, would you mind going back to the, the slide before the previous one? The one that sure. showed the soil investigation sites? Yes. So that red area, that, that's, I mean, I know this is from 2022, right? What was presented at the um, Water Resources Management Commission meeting in March of last year. So that red area, the retirement community, that's gone from the plan, correct? Yes, their, their, um, the agreement between the developer and the retirement community uh, parted ways, and that um, has transitioned into a um, a multifamily commercial district. Okay. Is there any benefit to going back to that rather large parcel and doing some sampling there? Um, so I'm just flipping back and forth to show that the, the, the area essentially has a, a portion of the red area got cut off and has been brought down to this area with these ponds becoming larger than previously shown. Um, the I guess the, the, the direction that we originally proceeded with this design was that this red area was going to be self-sufficient, uh, that it was going to provide its own stay on requirements, it was going to provide its own investigation. Um, and so not knowing what they were going to be doing, we didn't have a good guess of where to do the, de where to do the test pits is the, the easiest and most accurate answer to give. And so now that, um, I mean, uh, sorry looking, I mean, this is still pretty uh, theory-based and morphing. So I still don't think that we have the best idea of where the buildings are to be able to provide um, test pit recommendation locations. Um, additionally, to add to that, there's also the, um, the possibility that these facilities could be enlarged in order to accommodate these. Um, and so, that is the current direction that we're, we're kind of taking it is to expand these facilities to be able to accommodate these multifamily areas. But the intent is that everything that's colorized in this exhibit, all of it's going to get to the 100% stay on, not just the, uh, the areas outside the multifamilies. 
Thank you. And so um, the results, as I mentioned, the uh, we're looking at 52 to 64 percent curviousness for our residential multifamily lots, um, and then we also um, so the E is that area that we were just referring to, and J is this area just below it. Um, we assume that they actually are only uh, achieving 80 percent stay on. Um, we basically put a dumb a dumb box into both of them, modeled them, and what we're getting is 80%. So if they were to be held to 100% standard, our overall results would actually improve. Um, but we wanted to provide some level of um, conservativeness again. Um, so then the as Eric had alluded to, one of the conditions that we have, um, is we have, a, I thought I'd put the area, about 75 acres of offsite area about 25 acres is on the west side of High Road with 50 acres um, of existing agricultural field um, on the east side. And there's a culvert connecting them right, right across from this parcel here. All of that is kind of channeling through and it's gonna come onto our site. So we know that we need to accept it, send it through the site um, to its final uh, discharge location. So what we've done is we've actually accepted this and um, routed it into our wet pond and infiltration facility. And so that is part of the uh, discussion that we, we want to get to is, is that an appropriate assumption that we can take credit for this area that um, may uh, and likely at some point will develop into another development. Um, there's a small portion that is um, already developed, but it's by comparison, pretty small. We'll come back to this. Um, and so the results uh, show that without using the bypass flow, we achieved 97.4% stay on with all of the conservative assumptions that I provided to you earlier. With that offsite bypass coming through the site, we go to 101.2%. So we're talking about roughly 4%. Um, and so knowing that, again, that we chose very um, dense housing unit products to do the modeling that with um, you know any number of different uh, integrations, we can um, probably tease out additional percentage points um, to get ourselves to 100 without the offsite stay on. But we also know that there is gonna be water coming onto our site. Even in small storms, we're gonna get water that comes through. Um, and so I just provided a, uh, a pretty much a breakout of each of the, the basins and um, what, what, what we achieved. So AB is this northern corner. It's actually our, um, our lowest performer as it, as it is. Um, the uh, GCDHI, affectionately known, is the southeast uh, basins, and that's achieving 99%. And then EFJ without and with is 99 and 100%. So that's this offsite multifamily pond. Um, so that's those are the results. Um, a new topic that hasn't been discussed with Eric, um, but that was brought up during the CARP C meeting um, is related to the air the, the proximity of the site to the airport. Um, one of the commissioners um, of CARP C asked the question if we were in conformance with the U.S. Depart Department of Transportation FFA Advisory Circular 150-5200-33C. And she said it about that fast. Yeah. Um, and so essentially, uh, if you guys aren't familiar with this uh, advisory circular, um, it is looking to reduce hazardous wildlife uh, interactions with airplanes. And so the, um, the circular mm -hmm. recommends for different types of planes, different off, different like um, propel propulsion systems on planes, different offsets from the airport runway to the site such that you're not attracting mostly birds um, because they interact a lot more with airplanes than other wildlife, but they call it wildlife. And so 10,000 feet um, is the recommendation for plane types that um, are at the Monona Airport. And so 
our ponds happen to be 7,300, 8,500, and 9,800 feet from the runway, with the closest one being that southwest corner pond. And so um, this was something that um, Carp C uh, contacted me today, um, about two hours ago, uh, three hours ago now, and said that this is something that they want um, consideration of this commission um, to understand how this commission views um, this concern. And so what the what the circular recommends for stormwater treatment ponds is to either provide dry detention ponds that drain within 48 hours and that are also steep sided, rip wrapped or concrete lined, narrow and linear shaped. And in addition, mode so as to not provide food for wildlife habitat, that would be the recommendation of an appropriate stormwater facility that's within 10,000 feet of an airport. Um, they also would, um, they also go on to recommend that the um, detention could be a wet pond with um, any number of screening devices, um, floating fences, elevated fences, um, or um, underground facilities. So that's that's what the circular provides as a recommendation. Uh, so Nick we, Bauer is on from Carp C, and he uh, let me know today that he uh, did speak with the DNR, um, and the DNR um, is in agreement generally with the circular's uh, recommendations. Um, and essentially, if if push came to shove, they would go along with the circular's recommendations, um, so as to not provide create a state versus federal um, incident. I don't know if that's the best summary of how Nick put it. He put it much more eloquently than I just did. Tony um, or Nick, do you know which, can you share which commissioner made that uh, comment? You can guess. She happens yeah. to be a chair of a local town. And her name is Cynthia Richson. At this point, I just want to comment that we need to be very um, careful and respectful in our discussion of this topic, especially since, you know, we've had um, lots of conversations with lots of people about the airport over the past five years. Um, I guess my questions would be, would this not apply also to Bell Farm, which is closer? Um, you know, within that 10,000 foot um, area. And the, I guess, I don't want to talk about this tonight because obviously this has just sprung upon us. So I think this is something we need to come back to at the next Water Resources Management Commission meeting. Eric, what do you think? Uh, I think I'll take whatever you guys want to do. Uh, Bell Farm, doesn't have any wet ponds proposed. Um, Graber Pond is is wet. Uh, yeah, I looked into this. One of the first things when I started working for the city. Um, so I, I the city has no hard policy that I can find about construction of wet ponds. Um, in proximity to the airport. I'm familiar with this FAA circular and have quoted it myself in my former life as a consultant as a reason for not, you know, being able to build wet ponds. Uh, I'll ask Tony maybe, you know, what would be the impact if you got rid of those wet four bays? It seems like turning your infiltration basins into biofilters uh, would be an expensive solution. Well, that, and, you know, I'm, you know, I, I listened through the Bell Farm presentation and I'm impressed that they were able to get the 200 year peak standard without um, over inundating the bioretention facilities beyond the uh, recommended one foot. So our ponds have four or five feet within the wet pond. I'm going way back too far. I don't really have a good close-up of the ponds. Um, our wet ponds are fairly deep to provide uh, peak attenuation of a 200-year volume. Um, and so we you can't just turn it into bioretention and hit a 200-year peak. Um, 
essentially what we'd be looking at doing and you know i've had all of two on two hours to to think about this um we would turn the wet ponds into dry ponds. So we'd fill the bottom five feet of each of the ponds. And then all of the all of the green stormwater infrastructure that's upstream of these ponds would be providing pretreatment of those impervious areas. So then we would have to put essentially adjacent bioretention in for any of the areas that were going direct to the wet pond for its treatment. The infiltration facility at itself probably wouldn't have to adjust. Uh, the, dry ba the dry ponds likely wouldn't have to adjust. They work just the same as the wet pond. The issue is fitting in the additional pretreatment area to provide that pretreatment prior to. And then the, the last part of it really that I haven't figured out much or too well is the idea is that you're not supposed to provide flat areas with food. And so the way that our infiltration facilities work best is to provide them with deep rooting plants so that we are eliminating the potential for clogging. But we now we have to mow it to stay in uh, concert with the the, uh, the circular. So there's a disconnect there of how do you how do you achieve 100% stay on um, and also appease the uh, or don't appease the wildlife. So. Um, with the exception of putting everything underground, um, which again has has faults um, as well as costs associations. So, um, you know, I've been sitting with it and trying to figure it out. And, you know, it seems to me that you would have some sort of six inch mode surfacing uh, through, through throughout all of your treatment cells instead of, you know, attractive wildlife, um, butterfly bee type habitat plants. Um, I also, you know, kind of am curious about right now we have an agricultural wetland. It's, it's cultivated, uh, regularly. This development is going to take that out of cultivation and become another feature for, for birds. But then if you look right across the street, we've got hundreds of acres. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out the significance of our smaller linear ponds relative to the much nicer uh you know if i were a bird i'd key in on this area but um so you know it, it's i'm mostly concerned about our north side um the the number of residential lots that would need to be removed to accommodate this um would would be of significance al along with road routing um concerns um i'm not as concerned about these other two areas but it will take it will take some deep consideration um keen in on what you said eric i think it would be um of value for you know i don't know not saying that the city needs to come out with a, a position but you mentioned that you haven't found a position that the city has relative to development around the airport and so you know if if we were to follow the circular bell farms would have a really unattractive stormwater uh, feature to their site. Um, and we also would be have very unattractive uh, features on our site. Um, but it, it, it seems like the, the airport management along with the, the city, it would be great if they could get their heads together and say, these are concerns, these are not concerns. I mean, the fallow agricultural fields attract geese just as well. Yeah, there's a habitat guy with the Bureau uh, that I spoke to last year in regards to this and, and also another contact at the Bureau about the, you know, the weight of that FAA circular. Um, you know, if you look at from the air at the city of Middleton, there are numerous wet ponds. There's Lake Mendota within the radius, I believe, of the airport. There's, you know, Graber Pond, Tribeca basins that were built 15 years ago are wet and basically in line with the runway. Um, I think that circular, if it doesn't talk about it, I got this from a conversation with the Bureau of Aviation you know, one of the things that needs to be considered is whether or not we're setting up a new pathway for waterfowl 
uh, or a new preferred pathway. Uh, yeah, this brings up a lot of issues. Um, I guess I would suggest that we punt and uh, come back next month, not only to this commission, but to Public Works Commission uh, Committee and uh, I, I suppose hey, uh, Eric, I think this is uh, something for the city to decide, not the water resource management group. Yeah. Yeah. Is there value in getting a consideration from the airport commission itself to what do they think about the issue? I would think so, yes. We can do that, but I'll tell you, council just considered a land a land use zoning ordinance. Um not related to water resources, um, but development in general, and rejected it, even though it is something that's recommended, like all the guidance is recommended, it's not required, it's not a requirement. Um, and they rejected the land use zoning ordinance. So I, I can't imagine that they would take a different, that there'd be a different outcome for something related to um, restricting development. Um, as Tony said, you know, it, establishing a, a preference for unattractive, <laughs> unattractive non wildlife supporting uh, uh, stormwater management features over those that uh, sort of bring the conservancy into these new developments. I, I just don't see it happening, but we, we can bring it up. And I guess if I could, this is Nick Bauer with CARP C. Um, maybe just to give a little more context, um, as Tony mentioned, I did kind of spring this on them last minute. So to him and to you guys, I kind of apologize for that. Um, but you know, th this was a, a comment that was brought up during our public hearing last week by one of our commissioners. Um, you know, we we at that point, you know, we just really wanted to make sure we do our due diligence kind of, you know, investigate whether it's a, a little, you know, a concern to to deal with or just to take into account and kind of move forward. Um, you know, part of that is just getting the water resources group here, just getting your feedback, your opinion on it. Um, I, we know there's a lot of experience on this commission with, with stormwater. And obviously, like we mentioned, there are lots of other both natural and man-made um, water bodies within Middleton, within, you know, this vicinity of the airport that we're talking about. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you from, from a staff level, we're not overly concerned with it. As I mentioned, there are a ton of other natural and man-made <laughs> water bodies around here that are a lot more attractive to waterfall than these couple of basins we're talking about. Um, so again, you know, we, we wanted your your feedback. Um, it's you know, we're, we're going to proceed with our process as as we will. Um, if you guys want to table this until next meeting, that's totally fine. We'd love to hear your thoughts when you have had more time to mull it over. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I do appreciate your comments so far. Um, and I, I, the, one of the other reasons I did bring it up to Tony right away was after talking to DNR and hearing that they do, you know, as best they can honor this guidance document, um, also recognizing that it is just a guidance document. So, um, the last thing I just wanted to mention, I'm not sure if either Tony or my understanding of the circular is a little bit off. I do not believe that you would have to require mowing the vegetation. The concern was vegetation together with open water bodies. So if there's no open water body with standing water, then I don't believe vegetation is a concern. So, so I, that's all I've got. I'm happy to answer any questions, but just wanted to throw my piece out there. So thanks. All vegetation in or around detention basins that provide food or cover for hazardous wildlife should be eliminated. Okay, maybe I read it wrong. I guess I, I thought that was in the context of wet ponds, but maybe again, maybe I was wrong on that. So, okay. I mean, I, little children should be enough to keep the birds away, but <laughs> what do I know? Um, so yeah, so I, like I said, I, I think that the, the city should, uh, this should be tabled from, from here, but the, the city should come together and decide, um, to what extent they believe 
this development is going to add or detract from um, wildlife attractants to the airport and assess risks in, 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 in their own fashion. Um, mm. But uh, I would like to uh, go backwards, I guess, and uh, hear what the commission um, is thinking about where we were versus where we've come um, and this uh, um, opportunity to provide additional treatment um, to this offsite area and additional stand infiltration to this offsite area. Does anybody have any comments? Maybe I should go through my uh, staff memo in regards to this one issue. I would appreciate that because for me, it's it seems, and I'm not a water expert, it seems counterintuitive because I, I see bypass as meaning it's not going to affect us, but it, yeah. So the idea that you would take credit for additional runoff coming onto your site to me seems like it's doing the opposite of helping you achieve the 100%. So Eric, if you could walk through this and explain that. And yeah, then... sure. Um, so back to this 100% runoff and, and what it is we're modeling and, and measuring. You know, the, the model will take rainstorms over the course of a year, excluding the winter period of the year and run them through our basins or whatever we're building. And we're comparing that essentially to a model of the existing condition. And unless you're on a site that's all sandy soils, you know, even if the watershed is 100% pervious, there will be some runoff that's released during that average annual year. So the proposal is that they would be able to utilize that increment of runoff from offsite in an undeveloped condition. They're gonna be passing that through their basins anyways. This is just a means of, uh, you know, they'll be able to take credit for it if for lack of a, a better way to phrase that. That, you know, this is typically not allowed because you never know what's going to happen upstream. Um, water could be diverted. I don't see that really possible in this case because there's a maybe a 20 foot hill along high road that would kind of prevent a, a different flow path. And then the other thing that could happen is that upstream land could develop and treat their own water. That's not necessarily a big concern for peak rate because you're gonna pass that through anyways. And it's not as much of a concern for infiltration either. What my uh, interpretation of why that's in there is because of water quality treatment where it's relatively easy to get the first part of treatment, you know, it's it's essentially bigger particles, you know. So when we, oh, we'll take another step back for water quality treatment, the standard is to get eighty percent of total suspended uh, solids. With just a simple catch basin, like in a in a street, you might be able to catch the first ten or fifteen percent. And that's because that percentage is sand. And as you get higher percentages, you're talking about capturing smaller and smaller and smaller particles. So you can't, you know, if the upstream land suddenly started treating their runoff to an 80% level, all you'd be left with to capture is this really fine particles that are really hard to capture. And I. I think that's really why this restriction is in there. So I think as long as the condition we put on them is 
you're going to model this in an undeveloped condition, the offsite land, then that shrinks down this increment of runoff that they'll be able to take credit for. And that shouldn't go away. And we put the same condition on that modeling as we're putting on this development, which is 100% infiltration. But that that still allows some release of water in, in almost any circumstance. Yeah, and so how it's modeled right now is agricultural field. And so whatever's coming off of that field right now, when you put the 100% standard on the new, that, that field to the north in the future, they're going to be allowed to release a volume equal to what's coming off the agricultural field. Um, well, not exactly, they'll have to, Tony, because city of Middleton requires a free settlement condition. Okay. It's close to, but less than. Even less than. I, I guess one of my concerns I have on this is, is the quality of that offsite runoff in terms of impairing and impacting the treatment systems, you know, just if it's, if it's going to be kept as agricultural land for at least a near term, you know, the, the sediment loadings from there can be pretty substantial compared to a turf grass or a prairie or whatever else. Um, so I'm concerned about the impact on the, on the pra practices that are receiving this water. Sure. Um, that makes sense. And, you know, the, as I mentioned, um, and, and Eric also mentioned, we need to accept this water no matter how we, how we skin it. it it's right. going to come through our site. And so the, there's two options. We can either put it into a large pipe and run it underneath our site and discharge it on the far side of our site, or we can accept it and work with it. So upstream of our infiltration facility, we have the large regional wet pond facility. And so that wet pond facility is going to provide the pretreatment necessary um, to protect the infiltration facility. And so modeling it as agriculture um, and row crops, all that sediment that um, is, is able to come off of an agricultural field is accounted for within the model. And so we know with good confidence um, or good modeling confidence, we'll say, well, that well, we're achieving uh, the, the metric necessary. I mean, well, more than the metric, really. Um, the the, the requirement is to provide 60% TSS removal pretreatment prior to entering into an infiltration basin. And we'll be in an excess of that 60% um, for the whole system that's coming through. Tony, and so, you you know, we view it as we're, we're accepting water and we're letting, we're, we're accepting the water and we're providing additional treatment of that water before it gets off of our site. And so we're, we're trying to provide a better a betterment of that water while while also getting to the required standard that um, of the hundred percent stay on. Tony, when you say the modeling is accounting for the agricultural runoff and the sediment loading from that, what model are you talking about? In Winslam. Well, Winslam does not model agricultural runoff or account for sediment loading from agricultural fields. It's not designed for that at all. Um, so I got a problem with that. I see what you're saying. Hmm. Um, yeah, because it's modeled as undeveloped land. Yeah, that's not a, uh, that's yeah, not fallow. No, different story. Anyway, my I, my my concern stands. I think as far as the, the rate at which that pond will fill up with sediment. Now, I, I understand your dilemma. I mean, the other the option is to reroute the water around your site or through it without being treated at all. Um, I don't know, you know, what all solutions there might be for this. Um, but to make it part of your integral system, which is treating the rest of the development itself, I think could be problematic. Yeah, that puts us in an interesting position. Um, because we either, yeah, we either um, accept it into the pond, which then requires additional pond maintenance or frequency of maintenance, or we let it bypass the pond 
and it, which is what it's doing now. There isn't a pond now. Um, and so the sediment load that's getting downstream is the sediment load that's getting downstream. Yeah, I don't have any answers, just questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh... So what do we have to do, Eric? We need to make a recommendation or what? Yeah, well, I had recommended that this be allowed, but if the commission feels otherwise, you may recommend otherwise. I could see advantages both ways and disadvantages, so I guess I really don't have a strong opinion. I mean, what Jim just brought up is a separate issue, I think. Could you explain why? Well, the developer is making a choice uh, to either pass the water through their facilities or divert it. And I suppose there's a, a cost associated with each. They could either take up the land space and you know, build some kind of a bypass ditch or they can pass it through. I don't think they came up with this plan just to meet this, to gain this extra 5% of infiltration. Um, I think they figured that out as they were modeling things, but you know, what Jim's saying is they're gonna have increased maintenance costs if they pass this water through their facilities due to increased sediment load. Mm -hmm. So it's a choice between that and the cost of building a system to, to bypass the offsite water. Which facilities on this drawing would be city of Middleton responsibility? Any of them? Oh, these are all private facilities. Even the wet ponds down in the southwest and southeast? Yeah. So private being, is it is the entire development going to be an HOA of some sort? Or yes. Responsible? Yes, the whole, the whole development? Yes, the whole development is intended to be, um, have a homeowner association agreement and provide maintenance for the facilities. So the, the city, or at least the Water Resources Management Commission, maybe the city itself required or asked the developer to come up with 100% infiltration. And now without this bypass coming from the fields to the north, it would be 90%? 97%. Or, 97%? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm sorry, Lisa, did I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead, Jim. Well, I'm not gonna, yeah, the 3% the change, frankly, that's that's within the noise of all of our modeling and calculation tools with, with what we're dealing with here. That that's not my frankly my can my worry, uh being slightly short of the number. Um it, it is more, you know, it's gonna be a headache to take care of these things, but I but I don't again, I, I understand the a dilemma because of the, the site that's being developed. It's simply downstream from a substantial area that's not being developed. Can I jump in for a second? This is Chad, I'm the developer. I just wanted to give you some insight into what I was thinking in regard to this. As we had this opportunity to treat this water and make it better on the way down, I thought that was a good idea for everybody. I also intend to in the association create requirements to hire a monitoring engineer and the whole neighborhood will be responsible for maintenance of all these ponds. So we're splitting up the cost, you know, a, a, amongst a bunch of different people to hopefully reduce the impact on each individual. But I understand the need, the requirement to provide maintenance over the years, and I'm going to put in place the method by which to do so. 
And I didn't want to do individual requirements because I, I don't have a lot of faith in individuals ability to maintain their own systems. I wanted it to be neighborhood wide. It makes good sense to me. <clears throat> yeah, I don't just, yeah. Would someone like to make a motion? If not, I, I'll make a motion to accept the recommendations of the staff to allow this to take place. Seconded. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Do you have a count, Jim? Or, I, no, mean, I, I, I voted aye. So how many eyes do we have? Do you know, Eric? Aye, aye, aye. I think aye, we're okay aye. then. Seven. I didn't hear any nays, so. Yeah, motions, I unless someone abstained. No, no abstentions. Okay, the motion's carried then. Well, I appreciate the the time. I think um, this this helps us be able to move forward into our uh, phase one design um, with clarity. Um, but uh, I'll be uh, eager to uh, attend next month um, with uh, the little wrinkle. So, okay. Thanks, Tony. Yep, Thanks. absolutely. Thank you all for your time. Bye. Bye. Okay. Next item, Warren. Pardon? Next item is uh, proposals from Chuck Nunn. Right. Now you're just making a motion to approve the uh, proposal? <laughs> I so moved. Second. So all in favor? Wait, I, I just had I, one. I had one comment first for discussion. Okay. And this is the task order 19116, the presentation, um, the public education, the presentations at Middleton High School. I, are these just informative from about science or is there also um, some content related to prospective careers in this field? Do we know? I've seen Chuck's presentation. Oh, go ahead, Eric. I, You've seen it, Jim? Yeah, it, it's it, it's it's it, it's integrated to their to their environmental studies program uh, at the high school. But is it just focused on the science of stormwater management, or is it also about hey, you could do this when you graduate, and here's how you get there? Yeah, I, I've only seen it from a science perspective, um, uh, Lisa. So that's. That's been my observation. I know, Lisa, I did have some conversations with the teacher over there who I guess is part of the same program and she takes kids out and they do uh, infiltration tests. But- that's, that's Colleen, yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. That's great, yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. I actually talked to her about that. I, I gave her the idea for getting some cans of different size coffee cans and doing a little double ring test. Okay, hey, uh, we have a motion and a second. So all in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? The motions carry. So item number five is the Ridges of Pheasant Branch. Sophie and Lou request. Yes, and I don't think anybody's here to discuss this besides me. Uh, let me pull up uh, an exhibit here. All right, so this, I'm gonna get the dates wrong. But this development was started in uh, the mid 2000s and was 
partially built and then I think fell victim to the housing bust and the, de the original developer went bankrupt. Uh, somebody else came in and took over. And the bottom line is that these basins did not get constructed uh, as they were supposed to. When I started working at the city, this was a uh, dispute that had been going on for a while. And it, for those of you who don't know where this is, I apologize. We're north edge of town, just south of Whittlesey and north of uh, Chickahawk. And it's a, it's a privately owned streets, uh, private condo development. And this accepts runoff from, uh, I think I had seven and a half acres coming to this. Anyways, bottom line is eventually the dispute got worked out through an agreement where the not the original developer but the developer who took over the land the condo association and the city were going to share the costs to build this basin back to what it had supposed to have been built to in the first place um there's a cap on those dollars of a hundred thousand dollars so the city's maximum contribution is a third of that developers maximum contribution is another third and then the condo association was going to cover the third third plus any overages the project is already well over that hundred thousand um, dollars in the fall the condo association hired an engineer and a contractor to come in and do this Contractor went in, finished the work. I went out to final inspect it and found that the pond was not infiltrating well enough. Um, we got all three of those parties together with me. And, you know, I think everybody worked in good faith and everybody did what they were supposed to do. And due to an unknown soil condition, uh, the pond is not infiltrated. So we could go out and investigate. And I think the best thing that could happen out of that is, you know, another 30,000 plus dollars worth of earthwork to potentially over excavate the basin, backfill it with sand, replant it again and try to put it back into service. Um, I thought that sounded a little onerous. So I went and modeled this myself. And I found out, you know, even in the condition it's in, it's, it's not that far off from the infiltration standard it should meet, which is 90%. I'm modeling it at about 80% if I make a small fix which is to lay a tile in the bottom of the basin and hook that into the <clears throat> outlet structure where it will go and leave the site and continue to the north through another city owned basin and then off into wetlands. Um, I passed this through our reviewer at the county just to make sure he wouldn't have any issues with it. He doesn't think so either. And we're, you know, we're in a, a retrofit situation now so there's not really any room to do anything else and i really hesitate to ask for more investigation which may or may not even help when it's done and if it did it would be at, at great cost and i see this as a pretty small impact so i told the contractor, the engineer, and the condo association that I thought this was the way to go and I would seek your approval and then we would move forward with this solution. So you're looking at allowing this exception from standards for a small fee and loop payment of roughly 
thirteen hundred bucks. I'll finesse or you know figure that out in uh, with more precision in the coming weeks. And I'm asking for your approval to uh, allow that fee and loop payment. Eric, I have a couple of questions and just for the other commissioner's benefit. I, I know this area well, if you see where it says approximate property boundary and four bay overflow weir, that's my backyard. <laughs> so so I, I know this uh, project pretty well. And Eric, I guess I have a couple of questions. One, you said that the cost I, I knew there was a three-way split. I didn't realize the condo association was on the hook for any overages, um, but you mentioned that the cost had gone well over a hundred thousand dollars. And I'm just wondering if you have that figure. The other question I have is, I, I may have missed it when you were showing where the, where this, this additional volume will flow out. Is that to the right in this drawing? It is um, the four inch wide rip wrap spillway over there. Well, there is a, there's a structure, Lisa, that carries this out. Let me pull up a different map. And which way is north on this one, uh, Eric, before you move away? What's that, Jim? Is north? North is up. North is okay. up. Okay. Is this just to the east of Algonquin then? Algonquin, Wisley, and Chicka, whatever it is? That's correct. Okay. So here's Middleton Hills. Here's High Road. Yeah. And here's our area in question. Uh, Algonquin is right here. This kind of uh, peanut-shaped drive is, is Chickahawk. Mm -hmm. This is Whittlesey. And this is the pond that we're talking about. So, uh, Lisa, there is a outlet structure right here. Okay. That was there before and it's still there. There's a pipe that leads out from that outlet structure, goes right through those inlets that are almost in front of your home back through to this other linear pond that the city maintains just south of this multi-use trail. And there's an outlet point from there, which is a little uh, bridge. Yep. Okay. Out to the wetlands to the north. And on to the same discharge point as Redtail Ridge will have. And total costs so far, as I understand it, are up to 125 already. Yeah. And the condo association will have to pay the contractor to come back in and make this fix. And I'm just curious, given all the work that's been done <clears throat> in this basin, how the, the poor soil situation could not have been known well i don't have a good answer for that either my guess is that there's a lens of impermeable soil you know just below where we investigated to what do we gain by having more infiltration in this area i don't see it we gain much by going from 80 to 90 percent we're right above the groundwater table anyway. Well, this land is perched up pretty high, but I I kind of agree. I would assume this water is is percolating down towards the conservancy. Well, my daughter had a house on Long Willowsley Drive and uh, they have basement uh, water in their basement problems. So if you're trading more water, it doesn't yeah. help them. So I have a question. So the recommendation, this installation of this drain tile, what's that going to cost? Oh, I'm hoping under $10,000, but it's not going to cost the city anything. Who Who's going to pay? 
the condo association would be okay, responsible so, for okay. that. All right. And the condo association would also be responsible for paying this fee in lieu to the city. I'm just I, I'm just curious now. Is the condo association houses along Chickahawk and Widdesley, or just Chickahawk uh, area? Just Chickahawk. On both sides, both of the loops there. Yeah, there's a north and south Chickahawk. Yeah, so all along there, from uh, Algonquin to Man Mandamus. Mand. Okay. Yeah. If you can see what, oh no. Yeah. If you can see this cyan line that comes up, Jim. Oh, yeah, I see it. Okay. The so surrounding the chicken hood. All right. And ending at Mandamus. So where did the city's share come from, uh, Eric? Did that come from our fee in lieu of huh? I'd have to look back at that, Jim. Um, I don't think it came from stormwater budget. Rich, are you still on the line? Do you have any recollection of where we got that from? I, I, no, I'm here. I do not. I do not know where that came from, but I do not believe it came from the swab. It did not come from the utility. I don't remember seeing that in the budget. So I don't know if it was fees or. or I don't think it's fees in lieu either. I don't, I don't think so either. All right. Can I, can I make a motion to approve the staff recommendation to install the tile line and to accept the fee in lieu up of $1,300 for the. I'll, I'll second that. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion's carried. The next item is uh, the salt, road salt usage. And I, the one that I asked to have this on the agenda, and we've been at this over two hours. So it's up to the committee we want to talk about it tonight or put it off until next month. I can wait a month. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's a really important thing for us to be talking about, though. I'm glad we're discussing it. And so maybe putting it off for a month so that we have fresh, yeah, fresh think, discussion uh, would be good. I agree. I, After two hours, uh, I think we're all burned out and we're just allowed to skim over this. And I think it's an important topic. I, I agree. And I would like to suggest that for next month's meeting, um, we also get the Madison ordinance to look at. And I know, I know that the Senator Andre Jacques is uh, going to propose legis state legislation that would, uh, yeah, that would eliminate or reduce the liability for, uh, well, create a voluntary certification program. So maybe by then, um, this that bill will have been introduced. We can get okay. that to support as well. Okay, and I'll uh, suggest Eric that we put it on the top of the agenda, not the last topic. <laughs> so we don't get bogged down with the other two developments again. <laughs> it sound like they're going to be back. Yeah. Can't develop any more land for a while. Okay. Is there any, uh, the next item then is uh, any possible topics for next meeting? And obviously the salt usage is going to be on there. Anything else that people like to talk about? You guys were interested in the digesters. Um, so I've got somebody from Dane County on the line to make a presentation for you. Okay. On the hook, I should say. On the hook. <laughs> Eric, can you, depending on if, in fact, these developments do come back for more consideration, can we reschedule the manure digester topic for another time also? We'll keep the salt on the next one. I hate to have the manure digester and salt, and if these two developments come back, Red Tail and Bella Farms, 
Yes, that's going to be another long session. So, uh, okay. yep, I'll I'll see what Kyle's schedule looks like. Kyle Minx with Dane County. And and again, if other commission members feel differently, don't hesitate to speak up here. Well, I guess we'll wait and see uh, what takes place for our uh, meeting next week, but items we have to discuss. Okay, Eric? Yeah. We'll see how full the agenda is and move it around so we don't get bogged down. We obviously aren't going to be able to uh, make any impact on salt usage for this year. So, no. The irony is, I've, I've always uh, tried to use as little salt as possible. And after the last storm, and I got rid of, uh, I had to use my snowblower twice, the layer of water on there that froze. My, and I was, I'm in a shaded area, so my driveway was uh, glare ice, and I went out and bought salt. <laughs> <laughs> I was up against it, either that, either that, or fall and break my hip. So uh, uh, I, I fell, I fell and uh, messed up my shoulder. So yeah, it's dangerous. I tried sand because I believe in using sand, and um, that didn't cut it. So. We had a lot of complaints. Yeah. So I have a question about the uh, uh, <clears throat> discussion of groundwater issues, high groundwater issues. Uh, what do you have in mind there? I mean, we uh, do we know anything about groundwater elevations in uh, Middleton at all? Do we have any data on that? No. No, okay. I mean, uh, <clears throat> okay. I mean, that's the... I guess a, I don't see a long discussion. I think the key is that it's happening. Groundwater is rising because they're getting more rainfall. And so um, do we want to get more data? That's the, probably what I'm going to say. And I just said it, but yeah, we can have a discussion on that. You know, in the same line, I, I was always wondering why we wanted a hundred percent infiltration and red tail. 100% infiltration just increases the groundwater elevations. Yeah, right. So I wasn't sure why we did that. I think the worry is increased surface flows and, and duration of surface flows into the conservancy. That's all. Well, they're going to go, it goes into the groundwater, goes into conservancy, but it takes a little longer to get there, I guess. I, I, yeah, my logic would be, Warren, if it creates more base flow, that seems to make sense to, you know, from my habitat and right. stream right. point of view. Um, if it's flashier or, you know, we're not getting, you know, that yeah. I don't see it as beneficial, even though we knock down the peaks, you know. Being at the lower end of the basin, um, you know, the runoff from here is going to be long gone before anything else gets down there. Yeah. Okay. I guess uh, meeting's over with. Okay.